Hi, this is Guy Wallace, and today in my new video series, A Chat with Authors, we're going to talk to Gary DePaul about two books he has on leadership. The first book, Nine Practices of 21st Century Leadership, published in 2015, and then his second book, What the Heck is Leadership and Why Should I Care, which was published this year in 2020. Before we launch into both, Gary, would you please introduce yourself and provide us with your educational and experiential background? Yeah, thanks, Guy, and thank you for having me here. My educational background, I have a PhD from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and master's and a bachelor's from uh, UAB, University of Alabama at Birmingham, which is in history. When you start out in history, and I also majored in philosophy, you know now that you end up in front of a camera talking to Guy Wallace. So anyone who does that, just go in that direction. I am a, as you heard, an author. I'm also a speaker and I'm a performance consultant. I work with large organizations on helping them become better at their performance, working with their management, helping their management improve what they do and be more conscientious about working with the employees and their processes, et cetera. I spent 16 years in the field as a practitioner, as an indiv individual contributor, I see, and as a manager and a manager of managers. So I've, I've been at the ground level. I know what it's like. I've lived mistakes, I've, <laughs> big time. I've learned from them. And after 16 years, I went out on my own and decided to help other people not make the same mistakes and do better than me. Well, thank you for that. So tell us about uh, nine uh, practices of 21st century leadership to start with. I The other book I have is a Kindle, so I'm not going to be holding that one up, but I do have- You're not going to be able to hold it up. As a physical okay. book. I guess I could hold up a screen yeah. and all that stuff. But This uh, book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Uh, so so who tell us, uh, who was it written for? And you know how is it the same or different from the hundreds, if not thousands of books that there are on leadership uh, that one can find? Definitely thousands of books out there on leadership. When you, when you, oh, let me put it to you this way. You, you have a forthcoming book on analysis and you're, the way you approach it is that analysis happens throughout the whole process of instructional design. So that's, that is, that's your focus and that's what your stories are about. Leadership is like that you have people that take a particular spin on leadership, but it's usually from a unique angle. For example, Liz Wiseman wrote a book called Multipliers and her whole book is about those who multiply or make things better and those who are diminishers that bring things down. That's what, what her book is about. Uh, David Marquet is a was a nuclear submarine commander his whole book is about how he turned the ship around, which is the title of his book. So each of these have a particular take of either personal experiences or of a concept, or they'll take leadership and say there's four different types and here are the types, or they'll focus on competencies and, and values and, and things like that. I did something totally different. And this, this book was written for two audiences. The first is people like me who were managers and would like to have a nice accelerated rate into leadership. And so I can improve on how I'm productive and help my team be productive and increase engagement and so forth. The second group were faculty members at universities. I wanted to give them something that was completely different. And it is different because I don't present my story. I actually took 14 contemporary books. It started out as 10 and slowly grew. I took 14 leadership books and I did a meta-analysis. 
I looked at all of them, tried to find out, dissected them, find out what, what were some of the themes, what do they have in common, synthesized it together, and developed a new understanding of leadership that you wouldn't get from reading just one of the books. And even if you read all 14, you might not pull it together just because you're doing one at a time. You're not reading them back to back and, and trying to do deep analysis like that. So my understanding of what leadership is, it's completely different now that I've gone through that process. And I try to make it easier for all these different people, the people that practice faculty to be able to share this, to give someone a new perspective in how leadership is evolving and is different now than it was 10 years ago. So 20 years ago. So what is your definition of leadership that would be, you know, unique from perhaps these 14 books and the thousands of others? Yeah. The, the, think of it like this. There's traditional leadership and then there's the way people are starting to evolve leadership and, and consider it like a language. I'll give you a quick example. The word literal now means figurative. If you go to Oxford Dictionary, look it up, there'll be a one section that says figurative. You know, it's just another way of saying, I, I literally tackled five people on the football, game, you know, and, and it's just or yeah. So language is like that. And I really struggled with the word leadership and what it means. So that's just to give you a little bit of background. I had to distinguish leadership from management, which is just terribly done. If you do a Google search or a, a internet search for leadership versus management, you'll get some of the, it's like a wrestling match. You know, one is good, the other is bad. And even the famous Simon Sinek, as much as I respect his writing, he actually said that management is the manipulation of people to obtain personal gain, which is an insult to managers like me. You know, it's just like, that's a terrible thing to, to say. So here's, I'm gonna give you a definition. Are ready for this? The art of getting things done through other people. When I was in graduate school, I thought, man, that's, that's leadership. Mary Parker Follett says that is the definition of management. And it just blew my mind. And it's also, which he doesn't say, it's also blended in the traditional meaning of leadership. The idea of you have a vision and you're trying to get people to achieve something kind of blends in with that management definition. So I took that out of leadership, not because I thought this was a good, it was a good idea to say, this is what management is, it's not leadership. It's because of what I found in the meta-analysis, these other people did the same thing. Like uh, John Maxwell, I mentioned Liz Wiseman, and a few others like that. They look at, they look at leadership differently. And when you boil it down, Leadership is something that I'll, there's some elements to it. It's like a performance improvement discipline. There's, I'm, so if you look up performance improvement, I talk about it in the book, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can consider as performance improvement. And I actually list leadership as one of them. It's bi-directional. So when I am leading and helping other people, I'm benefiting as well. If you've talked to people like Margo, uh, Margaret Murray about mentorship, I'm sure she'll tell you that people that have mentored others said, man, um, uh, wait a minute, Bill Daniels actually said this in an interview. He said, these people think I'm helping them by mentoring them. I get more out of it than they do. So it's, it's bi-directional that you benefit from doing it. So here it goes, drum roll. Here's, here's how you define leadership. It is, yeah, exactly. It is helping other people mature their mental and moral qualities, capabilities, and behaviors, which is a really fancy way of saying 
it's helping people build character. With um, David Marquet, who I mentioned earlier, he says it's getting people to think for themselves and be, being enabling them, putting them in an environment or changing the environment so they, they can be at their best. And so that's, for me, that's what leadership is. There's a mental aspect of it where you're trying to help people think about things differently and take ownership and accountability and being able to apply themselves. But there's a moral aspect as well that goes with it, which when I say moral, just I think of that as simple, if you're gonna be simple about it, just doing right versus wrong. You know, what's, what's good for the organization, what's good for society. It's a little bit, it's a little bit more than, than just helping people think differently. So it doesn't seem to be so goal oriented in terms of enterprise goals. It seems to be more about, from your definition, more of helping people achieve perhaps their own personal goals uh, and for growth, for development. Um, yeah. That fair? That is perfectly fair. And one of, one of the key principles of leadership is just that helping people grow. I call it encouraging change. I probably should have called it encouraging growth. You know, you you want people to become better. You don't want them stuck in a, in a role, in a position, because you want them to be able to contribute not only to the people around them, but to the organization and to the larger society. So that's that's partly, there's a morality to that as well in trying to help people improve. So yeah, it's not so much I'm going to achieve X. It's more about how can I help these people become better at what they do, which if I'm a manager, consequently, it helps achieve X, you know? Yeah, true. So uh, let's, let's shift gears here now to the new book, which is very, very different uh, in terms of uh, the size of the book, the tone of the book, et cetera. So what the heck is leadership and why care? Now, yeah. who was that written for? Is it a different audience? And, and yeah. is it the same or different? There you go. Hold it, so up. This, it looks completely different. It has a different feel to it. And it's, it's written, here's how it came about. It's been on my mind for about four years. I've been wanting to write this and wanting to write a different version. Contrasting it with the first one, if you open up the original book, which is that thick, mm -hmm. you'll find chapter introductions, chapter summaries, appendixes, headings, subheadings, bullet points, all, and, and it's packed that way. I start out a chapter saying, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about it. Here's some examples. Here's why I talked about. I call it the deductive writing style. And I was very deliberate about it because people that are managers and, and VPs I talked to, they said, just give me the bullet points or I want chapter summaries or I need a list, you know? So instead of writing a paragraph um, that's thick, I would bullet stuff out to make it easier to scan, et cetera. The other book, no, completely different. There are no headings, no subheadings. There are no bullet points. I do list six questions at one point, but that's that's it. No chapter summaries, no appendix, no bibliography, although I have in notes. It's how I, I do I do have lots of references. And I use a style called induction. And I just kind of made that up, I don't know, a couple of months ago. What I would do is I would start off a chapter with a story a personal story or someone, something I experienced where it's about someone else. For example, I, one of the chapters starts off with Randy Moon and his introduction to becoming the new SVP for the department I was in and what that experience was like. I don't tell people what the book, what the chapter is about. The title gives you a hint of maybe what, it, what it's about but you don't find out until you're halfway through. This is really true with the with the, the bulk of the chapters. The beginning parts of it, it's a little bit like that and where I explain what management is and what leadership is. But after that, 
you have to dig into it. Uh, no summaries, like I said, so it's, it's very different. It's shorter and it's packed with personal stories. There's probably about 50 stories in there I tell, and it's not all Gary DeGrade or this other person DeGrade. It's here's how I screwed up <laughs> and here it, here's how it relates to whatever, you know, what I'm trying to get across. People, pe people want okay. stories. And so that's what I decided to put together a quick two hour read or takes longer if you're taking notes. Uh, I know some people that are still reading it, they do a little bit at a time and then they have to take a break and do a little more. Process it. What, what can you share about uh, what's, what uh, themes, stories that you have in there without uh, you know, giving it all away? What, what uh, not that we wanna do a tease, but uh, so what might I learn uh, as a walk away from from the read yeah let me let me share the randy moon story because okay. i just because i mentioned it and this is to give you an example randy moon was an, appointed the new svp started started my day at the company received an email said former svp's out he's doing something else we got this new guy then i get an email there's an all hands meeting show up you know, at the end of the day, we all showed up. There's like about 90 people there. And Randy does the nicety, niceties at first and, you know, whatever. But he does something different. He doesn't talk about vision or what he wants to accomplish. He starts telling stories about himself. And one of the things he said, which was really amazing, he explained how he went to Buenos Aires in, in Argentina, went to a client's office, walked out, got in a cab, and was kidnapped. He didn't know it, but he walked in a cab with kidnappers. And after not too long, they eventually let him loose, and he ended up back at his hotel. And But that's not the point of the story. What happened afterwards blew my mind. I was not expecting this. Everyone gets up, they start wandering, they get in small groups. I walked up to a group of people and they were talking and they're saying things like, man, I, I really like Randy. He is a, he's someone I want to, I can't wait till he moves to the office near us so we could walk in and talk to him because he's very approachable. And they just, it's like, you I'm thinking, you just met the guy. You don't know anything about him. He doesn't talk about, he never talked about what he was going to do or anything like that. But what's critical is the story resonated with them. And it made a connection because it wasn't about him being great. It was about things that tragically happened and how it's affected his, his view of, of, well, let me put it another way all the small things that gets people upset in companies. Randy's been kidnapped by, by potential murderers and those things don't bother, they don't bother him at all. So he, it made him approachable. And, and like I said, it made a connection. So that's an example of a story and it gets to a principle called connecting with others. And the whole chapter is about how do you connect with other people? Excellent. Yes, thank you. No, I, I remember the story. It was, that was that was amazing. Uh, so let, let's let's move on here. I want to ask about uh, the dedication that you have in this book. I I've, we've talked about this before, and I, I think that you told me that the dedication, when some reviewers saw it, they declined to review it because they thought it was somewhat controversial. But uh, I very much appreciated you stepping up to this. So. So talk to us a little bit about the dedication and what the heck is leadership and why should I care? It, it wasn't intentional. It was, I, I, I don't even think I was going to do a dedication. But something happened May 25th, 2020, that totally blew my mind. And that was the murder of George Floyd. Eight minutes and 46 seconds of slowly being strangled it's asphyxiate, I can't say the word, but killed. Fixated, yeah. Yeah. And it that had a huge impact on me. It made me think about things differently. 
what started out as a personal, I don't know, personal journey, I started reading about people murdered by the police, particularly Black Americans. And I started counting. I think on the main source, there may have been 90 different uh, cases where unarmed Black Americans were documented. I counted 141. And since then, there's been two more. Um, oh gosh, Daniel Prude, which he, although he was murdered in March, end of March, it didn't come out until August or hit the national media until then. And then last Tuesday, Mar uh, Marcellus, I got to look at his name, Stinete. I, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I just found out about this where a 19 year old was killed by police, shot in the in, in his car and his girlfriend was there and she's in the, I think she's in the hospital yeah. in Chicago. It just blew my mind. But well, you, I'll read the, the start of the dedication, but you say, I dedicate what the heck to the daughters, mothers, sons, and fathers who had hero ship thrust upon them, but responded, uh, resp responded brilliantly. Um, and mention some of the names, but you then you continue and you list 141 names. Um, I, I when I when I first you know opened up the Kindle book and started reading through that, that really kind of uh, uh, caught me, um, uh, affected me. And as I read the rest of the book, um, you know, I, I I thought about leadership with that having set the stage, and I thought about the leadership that's required um, in our country to begin to address uh, systematic racism, uh, white privilege, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, tell us a little bit more about, uh, so what kinds of reactions have you had from other people uh, regarding this? Yeah, the one that you mentioned, when, when I went to find people the right endorsements that appear at the beginning of the book, a president of a bank, I went through a VP and I was going through negotiations back and forth about, about getting the review. And eventually he declined. And Mint talk some, the VP mentioned something about risk being too risky. And it, it might've been too risky because he didn't have time to really review it and didn't want to commit to it. Didn't mm -hmm. understand what he was getting into or it could be, you know what, I warned everyone, I asked 31 people to endorse it. I think I got 10 or 11 or something like that. And, and a few that said they'll endorse it later, which I could add it later on, but whatever. Um, but there was, there was I, I did pick up resistance and they didn't want to put their name on it. You know, you're, if you're, there was a, a CLO, chief learning officer who did not want to step in it did not want her name out there. It was the political environment in her company, just she didn't want to risk her job. And that that became the truth. The as far as people reacting to it after the afterwards, mm -hmm. I get total silence. If you if you want to to really crush someone and you're against uh, Black Lives Matter or equality, equity and, and diversity inclusion, the best thing you could do is ignore the person. Because <laughs> I'd rather, I, I think the first time someone sends me a, an email or tweets something about how terrible I am, I'll probably go, yes, I've, I've made it. But um, no, I, I just, I haven't gotten that bad of a mess. You know, it, it's been more support than anything else. Okay. Yeah, I've seen some of the uh, uh, other reviewers. I went on to Amazon and, and did a review and uh, read uh, some of the other people, a few of whom I uh, know. Um, and uh, but anyway, so I thought that was very brave on your part. And uh, I, I appreciate, you know, it's it is a bit of a risk because it's because of the the current politics and the divisiveness in the country and uh, a lot of uh, I don't know misunderstandings and uh, but anyway so we we 
we have a lot of upside potential here. You know, we're opportunity rich in that regard. Um, so what else uh, would you say to those who might consider taking a look at uh, book number one, book number two? You know, um, uh, what, what would you say to them in terms of them making a choice to buy or, you know, go to the library and read one or the other or both? What, what can you share with us? Yeah, the, the second book, it, by the title, it pretty much says it all. What it is, why do you want it? And that's, that's what the focus is. The nine practices dives in a lot. It's a lot deeper. In fact, if I finish the, if I finish a trilogy of the second, of the second book, th that would be the first one. It'd be what and why, um, how do you do it? And then how do you teach other people to do it? That would be the, the trilogy. Mm -hmm. One, one thing unique about both books, it's, the second book is based on a lot of the first book, but written differently. There's seven principles that I address in the second book. Each chapter is a principle. In the first book, I think I have one chapter that talks about the principles and underlying beliefs behind that. And all that's derived from the 14 books I did the analysis on. So it, it's a little different. Just if you took that alone, what stands out compared to some of these other books is a lot of the other books focus on values. It's like courage, humility, authenticity, those things, but they're, they're abstract. They're, they're so abstract. The authors have to do a lot of storytelling to really put it in context. What I try to do is something a little bit more specific and address principles. In the first book, what, which I don't do in the second book, I address practices. And what, so that's even more concrete. How do you practice leadership? Well, learning about humility is not teaching how to practice it, it's telling you, I guess, some of the underlying aspects of what it means to lead. And I try to get a little bit more specific and, and it, the practices are, were a challenge to put together. It's, there is an element of management in, involved in some of those, just a small amount. But a lot of it is, is things that, that people can get, I, I think, understand. I use, a, I use a simile for each practice, for example, and analyze like detectives. That's the first practice. And the whole thing goes back to think of the definition of, min, of uh, helping others improve mentally and, and morally. This is, that chapter is about helping people think about their situations a little bit differently. I'm gonna bring, I'm gonna mention a name that I, guy I think you, you might recognize, Gary Rumler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, it's, if you recall, he said at one time, and, and Deming said something sort of like this. I think Deming, Deming said, of all the problems you have in an organization, 94% of them are because of a system or something other than people. And Gary Rumler said it was maybe 70% is due to something other than individuals. This whole chapter is about helping you as a professional think about what's going on in your organization, the problems that you're facing and not just immediately pointing to the closest person and saying they're, they're the problem. But it's also, you would use that to help other people keep from doing it. And that was the whole point of, 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 that, of, of, the, of that particular practice. So the first three are roughly around that type of a thing. So I get more, I get more specific. I try to give not step by step, but really make it concrete what leadership is and how to apply it. And you, you get that in the first book. Second book really is about the principles. I go in deeper detail with the principles. Um, wait for the next one to get into the, how the heck do I lead? And then the next one, how, did, how the heck do I teach others to lead? You know? Well, great. 
All right, let me, let me, I got two quick things here. So in the book, you were said you were inspired by hashtag seven slash 68. Please explain that. Yeah, when you look at the dedication, you're gonna see some numbers in front of the names. And the very first number is seven and the very last number is 68. And those are the ages. I wanted to, I, I wanted, I didn't want to just list things in alphabetical order or num by date when they died, but I wanted to show the age range. And that's what the hashtag seven slash 68 is about that the youngest person who died was seven years old and the oldest is 68. And then everything in between, you know, the last one was 19 years old. Um, uh, the Daniel Prude was 41. You know, it just gives you an idea of, of to humanize these people a little bit more. And, you know, it's not just, it's not just middle age or young adults, it's children as well. Yeah, it's sad. Well, in, so in the second book, what the heck, you, you avoid using the term leader. So, why and what should we use instead? Yeah, this is a tough one because it's it's my, it's almost like it's me. And I, 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 in the first book, I really get into the semantics of this, what leadership is, what it means, is it a role, is it a practice, and et cetera, et cetera. And you know, leader leadership is not a role. You don't have leader. I, I think saying leader is a nice way of of saying I I'm gonna I want to say executives, but also senior managers. But I want to use something shorter, and we're used to saying things like the leadership team, you know. And it's I associate leader with traditional thinking of what leadership is. I don't. I think I'm trying to get people away from this is a noun. This is something you are and that you earn, it's, it's actually, it's something you practice in relation to your role. I apply lead, I apply how I lead to what I do. And I could be an individual contributor and lead. I can, a teammate, I could be a manager, I could be a CEO, but how I lead varies a little bit by, the, by my role. So what an individual contributor might do to help their team would be different from how the a senior executive runs a department and applies leadership. And I try to get it around action. I think John uh, Maxwell talks about it in some of his, his videos about it being a verb. You know, there is no real leader. And, and that opens up the whole thing that, you know, people, it, people that are executives they're not all leaders and people agree to that. Well, if you agree to that, the, then are there bad leaders? I get away from the notion that there are not good leaders and bad leaders. There are no leaders. There's just leadership that you apply to your role. If, bad if people are doing bad things, it's not because of bad leadership. It's because of bad habits and, and other things. I'm either helping people mature mentally and morally, building character, or I'm not. So it's, and and I'll never get rid, I'm never ever will get people to stop using the word leader, but maybe by the end of the 21st century, they'll be, it'll catch on. It's not, and again, not all of this is reflected on me. This is what I found in the meta-analysis. They do yeah. use the term leader in some of it, but most of it, they, they try to shy away from it. Great. Well, uh, Gary, thanks for your time today and sharing with us uh, both your views and experiences and uh, little overviews of both of your books. Our viewers will be able to find links to both of your books and to your website in the show notes. Uh, but uh, thanks again so much and have a great day. I greatly enjoyed it. And I'm, I'm just glad to be able to share some of what I wrote about and give some insight. So thank you. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.